Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Peterson, and I am the Director of Program Innovation for Lit World. Lit World partners around the world with amazing community-based organizations to strengthen kids and communities through the power of story. In 2010, Lit World started World Read Aloud Day, an opportunity for all of us to reflect and to celebrate the amazing capacity of reading aloud to share stories, to build community, and to strengthen literacy skills. Today, World Read Aloud Day is celebrated in more than 100 countries and hundreds of millions of people join together to read aloud each year. This year, World Read Aloud Day is February 7th, and you know we are already getting the party started. <laughs> Every Wednesday in January, we are celebrating all things rad on social. Go to litworld.org slash worldreadaloudday Make sure that you're registered and that you're following us at all of our channels so that you don't miss out on any of the fun. So today, we are doing things a little bit differently. Normally, we are coming at you live on Instagram, but we have such a special global group of guests joining us that we are actually pre-recording to make it work for everyone. So today, I am thrilled to be joined by the absolutely amazing Vera Hiranandani, author of the Newbery Honor winning novel, The Night Diary. She's also the author of a whole, The Whole Story of Half a Girl, How to Find What You're Not Looking For, and her new book, A Meal in the After, which is a companion to The Night Diary, comes out January 23rd. Vera is also a radvocate from way back and one of Lit World's favorite people to talk to about World Read Aloud Day. Hello, Vera. <laughs> Thank you. We are also joined by Sadia Faruqi. Sadia is a Pakistani-American author and interfaith activist. She writes the wildly popular children's early reader series, Yasmin, and other books for children, including the middle grade novel, A Place at the Table, co-written with Laura Chauvin, uh, A Thousand Questions, and Yusuf Azim is Not a Hero. Her new book, The Partition Project, will be available on February 27th, 2024. Hello, Sadia. <laughs> and finally, our last guest is joining us today all the way from Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, I know for, for me, Sadia, and Vera, it is early in the morning. For you, Ritu, it is late at night. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Ritu Himnani is the author, is an author, journalist, and teacher, and her debut historical middle grade novel, Inversed, Lion of the Sky, is coming out and will be available this May. So thank you guys all for being here. I'm so thrilled to have this amazing group of authors joining us today to celebrate our countdown to World Read Aloud Day. So as you all already know, uh, this year's World Read Aloud Day theme is hashtag tell every story. For Lit World, tell every story is meant to be a call to action, and it's a celebration of the importance of diversity in storytelling and the need for us to hear stories from every perspective. So what does, when you guys hear tell every story, hashtag tell every story, what does it mean to you? And why don't we start with Vera, and we'll circle around. Well, I'm glad to be here with everybody celebrating World Read Aloud Day with Lit World. I do it every year, so I'm I'm excited. It's a tradition. Um, I think it means for me, tell every story to contribute to a kind of diverse diversity. You know, sometimes people feel like their story, if they've seen it somewhere before in the sense that there are just some, you know, things about the story that feel similar to them, they say, oh, well that story's already been told, but nobody can tell your story. So I think about the individual sense of having our own stories. They're all unique. They're all special and they all need to be told. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I, I love the way that you talk about diversity because sometimes I think we we get stuck in, in very limited definitions of diversity. So thank you for that. Um, Sadia, how about you? I realized I was muted, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I guess that um, for me, tell every story means representing everybody and their experience, even if they're marginalized. Uh, for me, it comes from 
um, my interfaith background, which I've been doing that work for a um, couple of decades now, more than that. <clears throat> and I realized from there the importance of listening to everybody, uh, even if um, you know they were just a one person in a room of a hundred that was different, or just just sharing experiences across cultures, across um, across. Uh, faiths across every kind of different um, iteration. And I think it also comes from being a parent. Um, it means that to me, tell every story means that my kids who are first generation um, Pakistani American, first generation Muslim American, a family of immigrants that they can feel seen, they can read the stories um, of their culture, their faith and realize that their experiences also have value. So it's kind of like a two, uh, it, I came to the same realization from two different paths. And so I, I really um, am immersed in that now. Mm, I love that. I love that, that ability to kind of expand that definition of family, even from those people who are connected to you. to so those people who are part of your, your communities or your networks or um, the ways that you identify. So, so thank you for that. Um, Ritu, how about you? So to me, tell every story means unlocking a treasure trove of every kind of jewel, uh, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, and celebrating each one for being so colorful, being so unique, and being so precious. Um, and I think all of them cumulatively, the sparkle, the glow, the beauty, they make up our lit world. And that to me is, is really what it's all about. It's about celebrating everyone. It's celebrating everyone's beauty and, um, and celebrating everyone's story because it's so precious. Um, I would say on a more literal level, <clears throat> Tell Every Story is about challenging stereotypes and breaking down barriers and promoting empathy, <clears throat> promoting understanding. It's about preserving history and culture um, so that marginalized voices whose stories have been set aside or discarded or ignored can feel empowered and validated. It's about racing ahead and uh, shining a light on, on social injustice so that we can have social change. And it's about transforming minds um, through bridging gaps between people's stories and finding unity, compassion, and a shared humanity. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I think that was a beautiful analogy that you gave that treasure trove. <laughs> Very, it's an easy way to see kind of how we're, we, we need to kind of dig and we need to see all of the, the beautiful jewels inside. I love that. <laughs> um, thank you guys all for answering that. Um, you know, part of this celebration of hashtag tell every story uh, has been paying homage to the stories that mean the most to us and that have shaped us in some way or another. Um, at Lit World, we talk a lot about the importance of books uh, being mirrors, windows, sliding glass doors. So, you know, things that we can see ourselves in, things that we can see the world in, and things that can transform our own existence. Uh, but we also know that books aren't the only way um, that historically um, we've heard or we've shared stories. Uh, some stories we hear orally or passed down, some of them are our own experiences or the experiences of the people who we love and we care for. So all of these stories are valid. All of these stories are important. Uh, and when we talk about hashtag tell every story, we're including all of those. So I ask each of you now, <laughs> what are some of those stories that have impacted you or shaped you? Uh, the stories that have meant the most to you. So when we switch it up a little bit, uh, Sadia, how about you? What do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's a great question question um you know i grew up in pakistan i'm an immigrant to the us and so i read stories or books in general in two languages and urdu which is a language that i grew up with in pakistan in english as well um it was sort of strange to me because in urdu literature my identity was very much represented but um when i read books in english you know written in the uk or or america or anywhere else i wasn't there i wasn't represented it when it was just this absence of somebody like me unless it was some weird old colonial story where you know i was the servant or something so um i didn't really understand this dichotomy i wasn't obviously very comfortable with it but 
Um, so I think that for me, that that absence was more of an impact than a story in general. Um, I was really close to my grandmother growing up and she told the best stories. So those were the ones that I heard more than read that really, really brought everything to life for me. She she told me make up, made up stories, you know, things that she kind of just came up as a part of entertaining a child, um, but also her own life story. She led an incredible life and uh, full of so many ups and downs. She was an amazing woman. Um, how she grew up, um, what her adult life was like, life was like, how she was a parent to my dad, and and then um, a lot of other things, so so on and so forth. Uh, uh, she also had this incredible storytelling style that just kind of captivated me, um, and maybe that's why I'm also kind of a storyteller in that sense, not not in a verbal way, but in a written way. But for her, it was. Um, a lot of just imparting those stories in a way that impacted um, her granddaughter, me, and um, that became a part of me. So I think that, you know, I can't pinpoint any one story I told. There were a lot of from fantastical to kind of scary to real things that were interesting or um, a lot of a lot of her just her life experiences. And I just I love that. I soaked it in. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I think you. You, you make a good point. I think a lot of times when we think about those stories that are important to us, they're, it's it's about the stories as, as much as it is about that that relationship, that connection that we have to the storyteller. And so um, and when we talk about World Read Aloud Day, when we talk about tell every story, I think we're, we're embracing all of those things, the community that comes with storytelling uh, and those relationships that come with it as well. So thank you for that. Um, Ritu, how about you? I'm so enjoying this conversation, Amber. I'm wondering if we can actually switch to have our faces on the big screen. I just oh, really sure. want to see everyone's face. Yeah, okay. Of course. No one yeah, else mind. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> it's like more enjoyable for the, the viewers as well. Um, so for me, ever since I was little, it was always unexpected moments of humanity and compassion that had me at my heart. And it was books like Charlotte's Web by E.B. White, uh, just the idea of an insect a spider, something that I despised, having so much compassion and heart for a pig, Wilbur. Um, it just, it, it blew me away because we were challenging stereotypes in, in animals. We were looking at unexpected friendships and it just, it was a book that was a springboard for unlimited possibilities for me. Um, and I think even in real life scenarios like the 1914 Christmas truce where you had soldiers from Britain uh, France and Germany who were killing each other with bullets and bombs one minute and then called a ceasefire and they met together in no man's land to exchange food and drink and play football together um just it, it for me it's a symbol of humanity's deep desire for peace and um and it's a hope that I really hold on to and and in many ways when I was doing my interviewing for this partition novel I, I heard so many similar stories of shared compassion, of unexpected humanity between Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims, uh, whether it was um, a Muslim giving his topi to a Hindu boy to take him to safety, or a Hindu woman uh, covering Muslim boys under her sari folds to bring them to safety. It, it was just a beautiful sense of humanity and compassion that has always hit me hard, and it's, it's definitely impacted my writing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and, you know, all of those examples, I think, going back to that, uh, I think often heard uh, the phrase that, you know, books should be mirrors, windows, sliding glass doors. I think the sliding glass doors is the one that feels the hardest to really explain sometimes. And I think you did a beautiful job of really talking about that, um, you know, our ability to to look at spiders a different way or to see somebody of a different uh, religion or or faith in us in a different way um, I think is exactly what that sliding glass doors piece is and uh, so thank you <laughs> thank you um, Vera how about you yeah I you know I relate to a lot of pieces of this conversation and um, I think it's partly my background my father grew up in what is now Pakistan, um, but it was before the partition, so it was India, and then he and his family had to leave 
um, during the partition in 1947. And what Ritu is saying about, you know, he lived in a community in Mirprakas where there was, it's not that it was this way everywhere in India, but in his community, there was a lot of respect and kind of a a lot of sharing of different religious cultures. Um, so Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims, there were, you know, sort of the respect of the differences, but then sometimes like my father talks about um, going to a Sikh temple a lot of the time. And there was just like a lot of, or even in just the language using, you know, he spoke Urdu and Sindhi and then eventually Hindi, but there was just a lot of overlap and there wasn't these sort of very bordered categories until he had to leave during the partition and then he went over the new border and everything changed and it was Hindus are here and Muslims are here and Sikhs are here and kind of changed everything forever um and so I grew up hearing some of the stories from my father um from my aunts and uncles in my little split level ranch in Connecticut and I was just sort of fascinated by how different his upbringing was and what he and his family had to go through. But also, you know, it's still the um, mirrors, mirrors, windows, sliding glass doors. There's also, you know, times where my dad would just tell me how he, you know, was trying to scrounge around for loose change so he could go get a suite after school, you know, and things that I was also trying to do. And, you know, he all he wanted was a bicycle. And I remember my first bicycle. So there were all these similarities. And yet he went through things that I never had to go through in my relatively safe, protected life in Connecticut. Um, but at the same time, I always felt sort of different. Oh, we, I think we lost Sadia for a second. Um, I felt different in my community. There weren't a lot of people from interface households. My mother's not Indian. She's from originally from Brooklyn, Jewish, and then my father's Hindu. Um, and there I was in Connecticut in this small town, and there were just very few people, both of Hindu or Jewish background, Indian background, and then certainly not all of it. So I felt very separate. And I think when my father, when they first went to Jodhpur and then eventually Mumbai, um, also had to kind of acclimate and, and feel separate and different um, because a lot of the Hindus that came from Pakistan were sort of treated differently than the Hindus were all, that were already in Bombay. So even within the same religion, there were just, there's all these lines that we put up. And I think I was just curious about that always, even when I didn't have the words for it as a young child of like, why am I treated differently at this school? And why was things like, you know, what happened during the partition? So I asked those questions over and over and I didn't know I'd grow up to be a writer, but I think I took that curiosity from hearing those stories and it kind of really shaped who I am today. Absolutely. I love, thank you. Um, and I just want to say, thank goodness you're a writer. <laughs> thank, good, thank goodness all of you are writers, because I think that that is, that's exactly what we mean when we're talking about telling every story, making sure that we are putting all of those stories out there, those stories that you hear, those stories that um, are, are from your experiences, your parents' experiences. We wouldn't know about these experiences um, without folks like you guys so thank you for telling your stories um speaking of telling your stories I know all of you um have books coming out and a lot of these stories focus in some way on the partition of India um and while this features in all of your stories all of the stories are different so can each of you talk a little bit about why you focused on this aspect of your shared history um and why you chose to tell your story in the way that you did um, so let's uh, continue the rotation. Ritu, how about you? Why don't you go first? Sure. <clears throat> so as a child, my grandparents, my parents, they never told me anything about why we were living in Hong Kong. And I never asked. Uh, but one day my daughter asked. My daughter asked me a homework question. <clears throat> why do people migrate? And so I took the opportunity to tell her that our family were involved in the biggest migration in, his in world history. And um, she asked me questions about it. I came up blank. So I took her to the one place where we find all the answers, the library. And at the time, 
We found children's books on the world wars and the Holocaust, but not one single children's book on partition. And my little girl accused me of making the whole thing up and it broke my heart. I thought, gosh, if she doesn't believe me, then it, it's almost as if the 14 million people who lost their homes and the 1 million who died, it just didn't happen. So I decided to write the book that we couldn't find. Uh, but how to write a book that was so deeply personal, that had so much rawness in it, horror and tragedy. The thing is, a good writer is at first a good reader. So I read, <clears throat> I read the crossover, I read Long Way Down, I read Inside Out and Back Again, I read Other Words for Home, and I fell in love with the vehicle of verse. I just, the raw emotion that it captured, I just thought this, this is going to be how I tell my story. And writing in verse was incredibly freeing. It was freeing because of its structure. I didn't have to worry about punctuation. I didn't have to worry about where I was cutting my lines. I didn't have to worry about the flow of my words. I could be as musical as I wanted to be. I could inject as many metaphors and any as many examples of onomatopoeia and alliteration as much as I wanted. And I could heighten the mood and the atmosphere through play. Um, and I just, I lost myself and I found myself through the words. And I think more than anything, it was the blank space around these words that gave me space to really uh, open up my heart and my parents' stories onto the page. And the beauty of the blank space with verse is that readers come and they are given permission to fill in the blanks with their own understanding, their own connections, their own experiences. And it becomes a very collaborative process between the reader and the writer. And that's what I love most about writing in verse. So it was a true joy. It was hard to write some things, but it was, it was a true joy to find the hope. And it was a true joy to find the nuggets of humanity that I so treasure um, in, this, in this book of verse. So that's my story. Oh, I love that. I cannot wait to read it <laughs> when it comes out. Um, and I, I, my hope for everyone, everyone, every child that we work with is that they find that same, um, or give themselves that same permission to write the books that they're not seeing, the stories that they know need to be told and that they're not seeing somewhere. So thank you for doing that. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the book coming out. Um, Vera, how about you? Um, well, I'll, I'm excited to read your book too, Ritu and <laughs> Sadia. I, it, it, I was so excited to just hear about your books because of that sort of, there needs to be as many angles and as many points of view on the story of partition as, and also every other, you know, subject and world event that certainly you don't want one book kind of standing for the entire experience. So it really makes me excited that there are more books and then we're paving the way for more books for young people. You know, I think there are many more adult books on the partition, but not so much for younger readers. So I'm just really excited about that. And I think um, for me, I, you know, I, I had this, I always felt like I was just putting these clues together when I was younger because I think the way that my father talked about the partition was to kind of protect me from the real story and I knew that I wasn't hearing the whole story I just I was sort of confused when I was little like what do you what do you mean you had to pack all your bags suddenly and get on a train and leave like what what do you mean and was it just something that happened to our family and and then I saw the movie Gandhi when I was 11, that came out when I was 11. And so, you know, of course it's a big Hollywood depiction of Gandhi's life and his role in India's independence and the partition and Gandhi is certainly not a perfect person, um, but I think extremely historically significant. And um, when I saw it, I was like, it, it shows a lot about the partition and a very violent, um, aspects of the partition. And I just couldn't believe that this was the same history that my father was talking about, the same event, that it was affected millions of people in such difficult ways. Um, and that my father's family really survived something that many people didn't. And I was just 
kind of shocked and heartbroken, but also I was, I was only 11, but still I did not hear anything about this history in school. Maybe there was a line of India's independence and Pakistan was created, but never like really what actually happened. So I, I think from that movie on, I just really wanted to understand what this meant, what happened, how could something like this happen? Um, why would people, you know, with lines drawn, why would they suddenly kind of so quickly turn against each other? How did these lines get drawn? Who drew the lines? You know, all of the things that happened. Um, and so I just wanted to create a story with the Night Diary first to kind of, as Ritu said, put out a book that I didn't have um, for a younger generation. And then I really, I really missed my characters. And I didn't even know I was going to write a companion sequel, um, kind of interchangeable, although you could read A Meal in the After without reading The Night Diary, but it's better if you read them both. Um, I didn't even know I would. And then after about a year, I really started to miss the characters. I started to wonder what Nisha and Meal were up to and how their lives were going. And I, I really thought about what happens after we survive something? What happens after we experience something really difficult and how do we rebuild our lives? And how are we both, you know, we hear a lot about like staying positive and, and finding hope and joy and rebuilding and resilience. And that's all really important. But when we survive something, and I was thinking about the pandemic in some ways, even though it's <clears throat> so different, I was thinking about just surviving something and survivor's guilt in a sense, um, but also the way that we are wounded and that's, we are wounded, you know, we carry that with us. It doesn't just get erased with finding hope, joy, rebuilding, resilience. Um, it's more just that we find ways to go on and then we do find the hope um, to go on that kind of keeps us going. But at the same time, we have to respect that we've been wounded. And so Emil in the book starts to draw pictures because he's not a writer. He's not like Nisha, he doesn't want to write a diary, but he needs to express all of these feelings um, as he tries to you know, rebuild his own life. And so he starts drawing in the book and we see his drawings and it's kind of a drawing journal for his mother who died um, when they were babies. And so in the same way that Nisha creates a diary, he creates this drawing journal and it's uh, the illustrations are done by Prashant Miranda, an amazing illustrator that I knew before the book and um, he was able to do the drawing. So it's sort of also how art um, can be empowering and help us heal. So. I love that. Thank you so much. I think I, so many things that are going through my mind as you're <laughs> um, talking about these stories. I love that your characters are storytellers themselves um, and finding unique and new ways to tell those stories. But I think one of the things that you, you hit upon is how important stories are for just making the characters of these big moments actually human. Um, I think we all hear about things like the partition, we think like the pandemic, um, like a lot of current events that are going on right now. And they're just things that are happening. And we forget that there's actual people at the center of them um, who like, like your dad wanted to ride a bike like you or, um, you know, scrounge around on the couch for change. Uh, even as they go through these big, big events, there's still people at the, at the end of it. So thank you for, for that. Um, Last but not least, Sadia, how about you, your stories? Unlike um, unlike both of you, Vera and, um, and Ritu, uh, I was, my experience was different. My experience was different because I grew up in Pakistan. I learned about the partition in school growing up. It was like history lesson 101 always, but it was very basic information and not not emotional. But I also heard about this event from the adults in my life growing up from the time I was aware of it. You know, grandparents, other relatives, anybody who was older, old enough, those stories were so emotional and full of grief and trauma. It was like recollecting over and over. And it was trauma that lived on in, in the entire country. Um, we, or I mean, I'm rather the grownups, they talked about it constantly, you know, any gathering, any social event at any time could like take a turn and the conversation would suddenly veer from other things into the serious territory. Oh, remember this happened and yes, 
where were you when 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 partition happened or things like that they would start rehashing what had happened and as a child i would just be like glued to it it was like watching you know in real time re them talking about it um they all had different experiences you know you've got a group of elder people older people together and they would talk about someone on a train someone walking hundreds of miles somebody dying somebody surviving it had a huge impact on me because i was immersed in those stories um as a child and um when i became an adult it became it was like second nature i would talk about oh you know my grandmother to my own kids and i wanted to continue that storytelling heritage uh, by sharing uh, you know, what some of those elders ha had gone through by talking about it to my own kids. Um, but whenever I did that, they didn't really care. <laughs> it was it was history. It was boring. It was, um, you know, they had no connection to it. Um, I guess that was for two reasons. A, they didn't, as American kids, they didn't live in that environment where it was being talked about on tv and in social gatherings and and you know anniversaries being marked every year by by having guests on tv or on shows and they weren't my kids weren't weren't immersed in that and then also the people who in my family had lived through partition um they weren't there anymore so so my kids and anybody that age was really not not connecting to this huge huge um hugely impactful event um, awful event that happened uh, the way that I did and my generation did. So um, when I when I was thinking about something to write as my next middle grade novel, I thought it was really important to write a story about the partition. Um, but from the perspective of that grandmother granddaughter dynamic that I had, um, you know, an elder telling a story that a young person is listening to, um, and then having that become an impact to them. Um, basically for all, for all, I think young people is that happening, getting a connection to that past, uh, but also centering their, their current experience. So the partition project, my book is written as a contemporary, uh, middle grade novel. I'm set in current times. It's about a first generation girl, a uh, Pakistani American Maha whose grandmother has arrived from Pakistan to live with them. And uh, she starts um, telling Maha stories about partition, just like I did when I was a kid. And um, Maha is like shocked at this thing that she didn't know about. And so she decides um, to make a documentary project. She, she starts interviewing her grandmother, recording those interviews. And then um, just, just the way that I heard those stories and kind of, you know, they became a part of my psyche that's happening to Maha in the story as well. And um, uh, the story has the, the contemporary piece, but then also every few chapters, there's a, a transcript of those um, interviews that she's taking of her grandmother, because I really wanted kids today, readers to see that connection that what happens in the past, it's not just in the past, there's, you know, we are impacted by it. And then we transfer that to our future generations, there's a connection. And also how important it is to talk to elders. Um, you know, we kind of sometimes as young people, I know I did, but I was the kind of person who loved talking to people who were, um, you know, my grandparents' age, I love that, great grandparents' age, but a lot of young people don't see the value in that. And I just wanted to, you know, um, say, if you ask them what happened in their childhood, who knows what kind of stories you might uncover. And that's, that's really cool. I mean, this was a, a horrific event, the partition, but in general, we all have things you know, when you've lived in a life of 80, 90, 100, you have those amazing, in every way, good and bad experiences that I think that we should share with our with our youth, with, with people who are younger than us. Mm, I love, I, as somebody else who also loves talking to my grandmother and the elders in my community, I, I love that that's kind of the focus of your story um, and how purely... Uh, storytelling that is I think uh, at the very beginning I talked about how you know we there's so many ways that we tell stories that are not just in books um, and whether it's getting stories passed down to us stories that are traditional stories that uh, we hear um, I think sometimes when we 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 think about only stories that are written down in, in books as the as the only way to tell stories we are doing a disservice to all the different ways that uh, we have in so many cultures, so many communities around the world, um, 
shared stories. And one of those most traditional ways is by passing them down from uh, older to younger members of a community. So uh, thank you for embracing that in your story and, and thank you for writing it. And I cannot wait to read it. Um, thank you all for <laughs> these awesome stories. I cannot wait for all of them to come out. I have a more additions to my reading list. It gets longer every day. <laughs> um, thank you all for joining us as well. This has been a incredibly amazing experience. Um, before we go, of course, we need to know what you are actually going to be doing on World Read Aloud Day, February 7th. So what are your plans for World Read Aloud Day? Come full circle. Vera, how about you? <laughs> um, I usually do some virtual uh, meetups with schools and read aloud. I like to um, record myself just reading, you know, a short thing and putting it on social media or on Lit World site or or whatever. So, you know, that's <laughs> that's what I like to do. Spread the word and celebrate. Awesome. We cannot wait. Uh, how about you, Sadia? Yeah, I, I have this one picture book that came out earlier um, last year um, called Rani's Remarkable Day. It is about a South Asian princess. And usually um, it's my only picture book because I mostly write for kids who are a little bit older. Um, but uh, that's the one that's perfect for a read aloud. So I'm doing a bunch of those. It's it's about, you know, a non-white, non-blonde, non-blue-eyed princess, just a princess from a culture like mine and um, being a regular kid. And I'm excited to share that story. Love it, love it, can't wait. And how about you, Ritu? So I'm very excited. This is my very first World Read Aloud day. I have to get up very early and I have to stay up very late. I have three schools that have signed up with me, uh, two in Texas and one in Hawaii so far. Um, and I've oh. told schools I am willing to wake up in the middle of the night if it means I can speak to your students. So I'm I'm very excited to meet students from all over the world. Um, I will be reading the opening pages of Lion of the Sky and introducing students to the world of Raj. Um, I will share about his deep desire to uh, win the Kite Festival and be named King of Kites. And I hope that they will fall in love with the characters and that they will develop empathy for this time period, for the plight of migrants and refugees worldwide. I hope that they'll draw connections with what we're seeing in the world today. Um, and I hope that they will also celebrate the resilience and the courage shown by those who went on to survive and adapt and um, sacrifice for the coming generations. And more than anything, I hope that they will applaud the unexpected compassion that we see in stories time and time over and over that gives us this deep faith um, in the power of hope. Oh. Beautifully put, beautifully put. I hope you sleep well on February 8th. You're going to need it <laughs> because we're all going to be celebrating so hard on February 7th, which is World Read Aloud Day. Um, thank you guys all again. I'm going to share one more time everyone's socials. Um, so if anybody wants to reach out, um, thank you guys all again. Please make sure that you're following everyone who was here today. Vera Hiranandani can be found at verahiranandani.com, at Vera Writes on Instagram, and at Vera Hira on X. Ritu Himnani can be found at rituhimnani.com. She is Ritu Himnani, the author, on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and at Ritu Him Writes on X. And Sadia Faruqi can be found at sadiafaruqi.com and at Sadia Faruqi on X and Instagram. Uh, thank you guys all again. This was an absolutely amazing and super fun conversation. Of course, don't forget to check out litworld.org for more resources to celebrate World Read Aloud Day on February 7th, 2024. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and X for activities, celebration resources, and more amazing conversations just like this one. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy countdown to World Read Aloud Day. And as always, remember to tell every story. Bye-bye.